Welcome into the 49er Access Podcast. My name is Sterling Bennett, and yes, I am the floating head currently on your TV, on your cell phone. And today, we are going to discuss coaching carousels. I know, I know, the San Francisco 49er season has yet to officially come to an end. Regular season, yes, but the playoffs are around the corner with San Francisco waiting to see who wins this week in the NFC and who loses this week to see who they do indeed play in two weeks in the divisional round of the NFL playoffs. And as we wait for those things to occur, Black Monday's already happened. Coaches have been fired. And when coaches get fired and GMs get fired, uh, somebody has to replace them. And unfortunately for San Francisco, it's been a lot of their coaches, a lot of their former GMs and assistants that have uh, jettisoned themselves and moved elsewhere to take vacant positions among the NFL, and there are two prime candidates on San Francisco's current staff in the front office that has already received interest from other teams. And the reason why I wanted to discuss this now, because once the playoffs start, we're going to have no time to dive into this, but I also want to get ahead of what could be in front of us as Niner fans. And if you're San Francisco, uh, and especially Niner fans, you know, and I know as well, what it's like to lose uh, people on the coaching staff, people in the front office. Uh, since 2020, okay, San Francisco has seen Robert Sala, Mike LaFleur, Mike McDaniel, Wes Welker, Demeco Ryans, Bobby Slowick, Rand Carthen, Kwesi Ad- Adolfo Mensa, excuse me, and Martin Mayhew. They have seen nine total either coaches or front office executive assistants, whatever you want to call them, leave for other positions. Many of them having a ton of success this year. Uh, the Vikings being one with Kwesi Adolfo Mensa, uh, Ryan's and Slowick being the prime candidate there, and McDaniel and Welker in Miami. Uh, so a handful of Niners in the NFL coaching elsewhere that used to be under Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch, now San Francisco finds themselves in a position where they can see two more people be leaving, potentially, this offseason for, I don't want to say greener pastures, because uh, the pasture in Santa Clara and San Francisco is pretty freaking green, but for maybe a, a better position that comes with fame, fortune, money, and opportunity uh, for people like our first person here being Adam Peters, Um, Currently, San Francisco's assistant GM, uh, he already has had a meeting with the Washington Commanders on Tuesday night in Miami, and you also heard of the teams, the Raiders and the Chargers, requesting to interview him uh, this offseason to fill their vacant GM jobs, and so Adam Peters is one. The other... You have to go to the coaching staff for this one. That is new defensive coordinator Steve Wilkes. Uh, the Chargers, like Peters, have also requested to meet with Steve Wilkes for their vacant head coaching job. And according to Kyle Shanahan, there have been other teams that have actually made informal requests to talk to Steve Wilkes. So if you're San Francisco, you've seen nine total people from your either front office or or coaching staff leave since 2020, just what, three, four years time, you are now in a position to maybe watch a GM potential candidate leave, someone who's been in that draft room since Shanahan got here, essentially, and Adam Peters, and Steve Volks, who you just hired. So San Francisco could be in a position to watch a GM leader like Roland Peters leave for elsewhere, or... Even see Steve Wilkes for the second consecutive year leave your team, leave your defensive coordinator job vacant yourself, having to scramble and find somebody else. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this now is somewhat to predict the future and get into my crystal ball, but also tell you why I don't think Steve Wilkes actually is going to leave San Francisco this season. At least not yet. I do think in two years' time, we could see Steve Wilkes leave. And I think this all goes back to when they hired him as the defensive coordinator. Go back one year's time. Steve Oaks had done a relatively good job uh, bringing the Panthers out of the 
the seller, right? When they had Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold and uh, had that defense playing extremely well down the stretch last season. And that kind of ended oddly in Carolina. They go into the Frank Reich era, go draft Bryce Young. They make a handful of changes, change the entire staff over, uh, thinking they're making the right choice. Now, obviously, almost every single coach there has been fired, including the GM and the head coach and the quarterback coach and the offensive coordinator. There has been so many changes there, but Steve Wilkes was someone who was thought to be a prime candidate to keep that job. Obviously, didn't happen ends up in San Francisco, and keep in mind also that Steve Wilkes, a secondary coach to defensive coordinator, the NFL is going into an offensive, uh, I guess you can say, era, where they have been for a long time, we're currently in it, where defensive coaches truly or really don't succeed in the NFL as a head coach. There are a handful here and there. Uh, my mind thinks of Brian Dable, uh, with the Giants, although he does have a good offensive mind in him. He came from the Patriot way and the Buffalo Bills way, uh, but the biggest prime example of a defensive coordinator succeeding is either Bill Belichick for a long time with Tom Brady and or Sean McDermott uh, with the Buffalo Bills, which we'll see if both those guys keep their jobs if the Bills lose in the playoffs early, but uh, defensive minds, defensive coaches usually don't last as a head coach for more than two, three, four seasons uh, in which a team wants a young quarterback to spark their, you know, their culture change. And this defensive minds usually don't last. Brandon Staley being one of the big, biggest examples of that of recent memory where you have a young quarterback in Justin Herbert who's crushing it and they just can't seem to get over the hump. Staley's defense isn't playing well, gets it in his own way, and then it becomes a massive disaster, gets fired midseason, uh, where they gave up like 60 points to the Raiders <laughs> in prime time this year and uh, loses that playoff game against the Jaguars just one year ago. So defensive minds don't usually last. Well, I don't think that was the reason they brought Wilkes in here. I do think they thought that Wilkes isn't going to be one and done here and I don't think so either so nine minutes into the podcast let's look at what are the open positions for Adam Peters and for Steve Wilkes uh, the Panthers have a GM and head coaching vacancy the Las Vegas Raiders again don't have a GM don't have a head coach all the Raider fans will tell you otherwise the Chargers again no head coach no GM. The Falcons fired uh, Arthur Smith. They don't have a head coach. The Commanders, they don't have a head coach. They don't have a defensive coordinator. And I don't think they have a GM either. So they are in a complete rehaul with their new regime, uh, taking Dan Snyder out of the way, getting a new ownership group in there. They are recalibrating everything. Then you have the Titans, who surprisingly fired Mike Vrabel this morning and Look, uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, Rand Carthen, former Niner executive front office member. Uh, it, it, that's a weird situation in Tennessee. The, 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 the owner of the team, she made that move herself. And so it has many people questioning what's going on in Tennessee, which could make some people leery of joining them. I do think Rand Carthen brings some credibility to that role. And But when you see Mike Vrabel, a respected man, respected coach who whether retired or even players like Derrick Henry saying, wow, like you, you fired a really good coach. Um, many people are questioning that move. Then you have the wild card in all of this being the New England Patriots, because at the moment, the, the thought, the rumor is that Bill Belichick is likely to be done in New England, uh, capping off really one of the worst seasons in their history, or at least under him as a head coach, but also capping off potentially one of the greatest head coaches, uh, head coaching uh, regimes of all time. Uh, Belichick, I think, needs to move on. I think the Patriots, Tom Brady's already gone. You gave Bill a handful of seasons afterwards. Uh, they've gone through three different quarterbacks this year. They've started one at halftime, and then you know they've gone through Billy Zapp and Mac Jones, and they just been a massive quarterback carousel with Bill Belichick the past year or so and it just feels like there's an ick in the building and they need to get rid of the ick 
Uh, so that's kind of the wild card here is if they don't fire Bill, uh, maybe Mike Vrabel becomes kind of the, the big, you know, you know, 1A, 1B head coaching candidate. But as of right now, there are six head coaching openings with the Patriots potentially being number seven if they fire Bill Belichick. So we have seven potential head coaching opportunities out now. There could be more. Uh, again, watch out for Sean McDermott and the Bills. Already fired Ken Dorsey, their offensive coordinator, earlier, earlier this year. Seem to have kind of picked things back up. Number two seed in the AFC this season after beating the Dolphins in Week 18. But if they lose early, let's say to Pittsburgh, which would be insane, but if they don't get to where they want to be, right? Uh, I We could see some massive changes in Buffalo. Um, other than Buffalo, I also wouldn't be surprised if the Cowboys make a change. Uh, Mike McCarthy being Mike McCarthy, um, he'll get a job elsewhere, but you just have to wonder, Jerry Jones being very impatient, could that be a place where they change head coaches? Uh, but with that said, when you have seven, which I guess could be nine or ten uh, head coaching vacancies once you know the full offseason begins, barring the playoffs, um, you have to go to who are the actual like, you know, key candidates to take those six to seven right now jobs, if these are the jobs going to be available all off season long, and the only ones going to be open all season long, uh, the top candidates in no particular order are Lions offensive coordinator Ben Johnson. Uh, they're also having Aaron Glenn, their defensive coordinator, get requests for interviews as well. Uh, Titans head coach, or at least now former Titans head coach Mike Vrabel, is going to be one of the more allotted names on the market. Then you have Bill Belichick, if he does indeed get fired by the Patriots. You have Texans offensive coordinator and Kyle Shanahan disciple Bobby Slowick. Um, done a great job with C.J. Stroud this year under the Mecca Ryans. Uh, he'll be a hot commodity this offseason. Then you have guys like Dan Quinn, Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator, who was the head coach of the Falcons when Kyle Shanahan was there in 2016 and even before that. Uh, then you go to San Francisco, you have Steve Wilkes. Then you get down to the the, the Rams, Raheem Morris. Uh, Kyle Shanahan himself said recently that Raheem Morris deserves to be a head coach somewhere in the next year or so. So he can be out there for the taking for a handful of teams. Uh, then you go to the Ravens, this year's number one seed in the AFC, who handed San Francisco a big fat L on Christmas Day. Uh, they have two guys, Todd Monken, the offensive coordinator, and their defensive coordinator, Mike McDonald. Uh, both of them will at least be getting a handful of interviews, if not the most, this offseason. Then you move all the way down to the Raiders and you have Antonio Pierce, their interim head coach, who I would assume will have a handful of people clamoring for him to be the Raiders head coach in the next years uh, to come. Uh, then there's the extra added, you know, will they, won't they wild card, which is X Niner head coach Jim Harbaugh, which, you know, Jim, congratulations. You won the national championship. Uh, you're coming off the biggest win of your coaching career with Michigan. I couldn't think of a better way to kind of have a send off as, hey, I got you a chip and now I'm going to try to get the big one in the NFL. Uh, could we see Jim Harbaugh leave Ann Arbor, leave Big Blue for the NFL once again? Has a new agent in Don Yee. Does that make a difference? That's also Jimmy Garoppolo's agent. Does that matter? Probably not. <laughs> but still, um, it just seems like there is changes on the horizon for Jim Harbaugh. Uh, but Jim also, after they won the championship, was saying, like, we're getting ready for practice in a week or so. So uh, who knows what Jim's thinking, but there are so many candidates out there where it leads me to think if you have 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 candidates out there, what are like the actual realistic candidates for each position? Or at least in my opinion, what are like the top five candidates that will probably be head coaches this offseason when it's all said and done, working under the assumption 
that uh, Mike Vrabel takes the Patriots head coaching job once Bill Belichick is indeed fired, or at least, you know, they amicably part ways, as it will probably be uh, said, or, or, or he'll he'll resign respectively, right? Um, which we all know what that means. <laughs> but uh, I think the number one head coaching candidate this offseason is by far uh, Lions offensive coordinator Ben Johnson. Uh, he makes a ton of sense with the Chargers. They have Herbert um, as a quarterback off the injuries. Like They have to revamp that team. And anybody going into that situation knows how cap strong they are. Uh, it's a bunch of aging veteran players who are always hurt with a defense that looks like it's, you know, just bare bones um, and an offense that has some weapons, but uh, the last two years hasn't lived up to its potential. They haven't drafted particularly uh, uh, very well <laughs> the past few years, but you get Ben Johnson in there, you get Herbert in there, and maybe you find some magic, you put together some wins, and maybe you finish... Uh, over the Raiders, over the Broncos in the AFC West, become a wild card teamer, or maybe things go crazy and you hope Ben Johnson can have a Jared Goff-like uh, impact like he's had in Detroit on Herbert and the Chargers offense. And then you find someone to be your defensive coordinator and figure things out from there. Uh, then you have the Carolina Panthers for Ben Johnson. A new head coach uh, is needed in Carolina with a young quarterback in Bryce Young who just had an awful year that wasn't his fault. Um, it certainly feels like for Bryce Young that uh, you are going to have your second head coach or I guess technically your third head coach in what looks like just two years, right? Um, you had Frank Reich, you have the interim guy now, and then you're going to have a new one likely once next season begins. I think Ben Johnson would be the perfect fit for Carolina uh, with their, their drink-tossing GM, who's a nutbag out there. Uh, it just feels like they need a young, fresh mind in the building, with Bryce Young to actually utilize his strengths. Uh, Frank Reich just had lost his mind earlier in the year. There was certainly hope from my end that he'd actually be a good head coach and, and bring a nice system in for Bryce Young, and just nothing seemed to stick, uh, which... For Bryce Young, number one overall pick this year, you don't have your first round pick this year, which I think they won, what, two games? You're wishing you had that pick back, but uh, it just seems like there was so much turmoil in Carolina that a new head coach, a young, bright mind like Ben Johnson, some fresh air in the building with Bryce Young, uh, you're at least pairing Bryce Young with arguably his best chance to succeed when it comes to having a new head coach. Um, Bryce Young, although not accomplished so far in his young NFL career, I I do think has much higher potential than Jared Goff does. And you give him Ben Johnson, you see what he can do. Uh, we've seen what Ben Johnson can do in Detroit the past couple years. This year has been incredible for him. Uh, I want to see what he can do putting together a team in Carolina with uh, Bryce Young. Then you move down to the number two option. I think it's Jim Harbaugh, who, again, is still in Michigan, under contract, but, again, new agent, just won a championship. Would he want to leave? I think for Jim Harbaugh, it gets really kind of concerning because of all the people, right? Ben Johnson, Harbaugh, Slowick, Monken, Belichick, Dan Quinn, Steve Wilkes, Pierce McDonald— of all of them, maybe outside of Belichick, Jim Harbaugh is going to want— total complete control of the next franchise he you know, jumps into and tries to take over right when he was in san francisco um he butted heads with jed york we know how it ended here it wasn't very pretty for him uh just came back last season i believe for the first time ever just to watch us get spanked by the chiefs uh, at levi stadium but it seems like the hatchet has been buried with him and jed york but um I do think for Jim Harbaugh being a no-nonsense kind of guy, uh, he's either going to go to one of two places. Now, one is going to go against everything I just said. The other is going to feed in exactly what he might want. Uh, the first one is the Chargers, which just... <sighs> for Jim Harbaugh, he will have a chance to clean house, gut the entire team, completely rebuild that roster, 
He'll take, you know, trading Khalil Mack or Joey Bosa and just moving pieces around to clear up cap space and give him a year or two to completely rechange uh, that organization and really make that team his own, get get them out of cap hell after a year or two. And then once year three comes, you have Herbert, boy, like two years into that new contract extension, three years into it, ready to go, right? And it feels like for Jim Harbaugh, that would make a lot of sense for him. But on the flip side, uh, then you have the Las Vegas Raiders, which, again, uh, I know a ownership group that's been too hands-on that isn't afraid to fire a person in year one that the, the Davises for as long as I've been alive and even before that had just been one of the most interesting ownership groups to watch. Uh, their mind is never set. I feel like they've had 35 head coaches in 20 seasons since I've been around, <laughs> since I've been on this earth for 27 years. Uh, but since 2000, it feels like they've had 30 different head coaches, which makes no sense. Um, just how much dysfunction's been there um, and just how much they need a win. Uh, Antonio Pierce is certainly a candidate for this job in Las Vegas. Uh, I think he deserves a ton of credit. And I also think that if I'm Las Vegas, uh, the team has bought into him. It may not be, you know, a championship level team, but you were on you were on the brink of playoff stardom and you were taking the Chiefs down to the stretch in the last game of the season or second to last game of the season for you. Um, and, and Antonio Pierce will make me run through a wall for him. The way he talks, uh, he has players buying in. Devontae Adams wants him to stay. I would not blame Mark Davis if he does indeed retain Antonio Pierce as his head coach. In fact, that's what I would do. If I was him now, I'd give him a two or three year contract. You're not getting five or seven years from me. You're not getting a John Gruden 10 year kind of deal. But if you're Jim Harbaugh and they can have Jim come in and let's say it's like, look, Mark, I know you're hands on, but I'm Jim Mother F and Harbaugh who just won a national championship, has had more success in the past decade out of the NFL and the handful of years I was in the NFL than your team has had since 2002. 2002. I was six years old <laughs> the last time the Raiders were actually vying for a Super Bowl, or they're actually a serious candidate. Now, I get they were 13 and three, and Derek Carr broke his leg, and Connor, the Connor Cook game, right? But it feels like if you're the Raiders, do you want to, I guess, take a risk? on Antonio Pierce being the guy, which I wouldn't blame them for doing so, or do you want to completely buy in and hand all your chips over to Jim Harbaugh and say, lead me, lead me to the promised land. Um, if I'm Jim Harbaugh, I know Jimmy Garoppolo's still there. I, I know there's some star power still there. Now Jimmy G probably going to get cut this offseason. The reason why I bring him up is Don Yee's agent. Uh, they know how to do work with the Davises. Could that be something? Uh, maybe it's a stretch. It certainly could be. But I, I just think Jim Harbaugh to Vegas makes a ton of sense. He's not going to Carolina. He's not going to Washington. He wants a big market where he can flourish. And I think Vegas is desperate enough that they have to have a W. They have to have a win. Could they go the small market Antonio Pierce route? Sure, but I would not be surprised if Jim Harbaugh ends up there. So that's two jobs off the board. Ben Johnson to Carolina, Jim Harbaugh to the Raiders. My number three of my top five coaching candidates is Bill Belichick, who if he gets fired, again, that's a big if there, but I think it's going to happen, or again, quote unquote, resigns. Um, I think Jim Harbaugh may, or excuse me, I think Bill Belichick could he make sense in Washington, a new ownership group? Uh, they're trying to, you know, make a big statement here. There's rumors that Russell Wilson might go there once the Broncos release him or try to trade him away. And Bill, I, I, I get it. He would bring some pedigree. He would bring some credibility to the Washington Commanders. Dan Snyder's gone. You got rid of that cancer that he was in the ownership group. Then you bring in Bill Belichick and you go, okay, like Washington has some leadership, some direction, but I just think Bill isn't ready for a rebuild. Um, that to me is kind of a no-go for Bill. He tried that in New England and it wasn't very good. I, I, I think he wants to go to a place that he doesn't have to tweak 
too much and already has a quarterback. Um, with that being said, one other wild card candidate I have for Bill Belichick is the Atlanta Falcons of all places, where they missed the playoffs by a game this year. Had they had some consistent quarterback play, I think they are better than the Saints, who are a veteran team with a bad quarterback that checks down, down by 14 with five minutes left. Yikes. I also think that you get a veteran quarterback in there that actually knows what he's doing, like a Russell Wilson or somebody else. Heck, even if it's Jimmy G, which I know had an awful year this year for the Raiders, someone that Bill Belichick is tied to that has a history with, that can just be a viable, not kill me kind of quarterback in that system, which is not the same one McDaniels runs, mind you, or ran this past year in Vegas. Uh, I do think that uh, there could be a chance. Maybe it's an off chance. Maybe it's a 1% chance. But just the Falcons might, like, I've heard that they are going to make a heavy push for Bill Belichick, and we'll see what happens when it's all said and done. But I don't have Bill going there. In fact, I have Bill going to the Los Angeles Chargers again. I think Bill, the rebuilds are done. He and the Mac Jones, the Bailey Zappi stuff, the Malik Cunningham back and forth, who's going to be your quarterback conversation. I think he hates it. Uh, I know Charger fans want Bill Belichick extremely bad. And I think if you're Bill Belichick, you go get Justin Herbert. Talk about the upgraded quarterback that is. From Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi and Malik Cunningham and whoever else you're putting in there. Chris Strebler, I think, was there for a handful of times. Uh, you go from that pile of literal, utter garbage to Justin Herbert, who, yes, the Chargers have their cap issues. Yes, they have problems defensively. Bill being a defensive mind, like, go watch those Patriots games this year for how awful they were to watch. The defense was actually playing pretty well for a handful of games, even though they lost. Um, I think Bill could make it work in Los Angeles. You know, bolt up, buddy. They could literally call him Bolt Up Bill. I mean, it just works. <laughs> it just works that way. Good old Bolt Up Bill out there in Los Angeles. Um, he wouldn't be... You know, he'd be the the little the you know the, the little brother to the Rams. There wouldn't be much spotlight on him. Again, it's Bill Belichick. It'll be some spotlight, but you have Bill Belichick and Justin Herbert. Um, you have a, a, a top ten quarterback easily, at least physically. Um, then you have Bill making the defensive you know change, and maybe he even wants to keep on Kellen Moore as the offensive coordinator, where he takes the defense. You get a healthy Herbert, a healthy Rashawn Slater, and actually a healthy receiving core. Uh, may maybe things change. Maybe just a fresh breath of air from the 70-something-year-old Bill Belichick makes some improvements in L.A. I think that's where Bill's going to go. Again, some might say, well, it's L.A. It's, it's the bright lights. It's the Chargers. <laughs> like, let's relax a little bit. But I do think that makes a ton of sense for Bill. No more rebuilds. Get you a quarterback in there. Bill is older now. He has no time for drafting quarterbacks. He'll have one in L.A. And he can just kind of hide away as the second fiddle to the Rams and just win a bunch of games if this does indeed come to fruition. That's three jobs gone. Ben Johnson to the Panthers. Jim Harbaugh to the Raiders. And Bill Belichick to the Chargers leaving just three jobs left. Where are, or who is going to fill the Titans head coaching job, the Falcons head coaching job, and what are the commanders going to do? Okay, three head coaching positions left. My number four head coaching candidate is Bobby Slowick. Um, he is the current OC for the Houston Texans. I think if They'll say Ben Johnson wants to go to the Chargers. I think he makes a ton of sense in Carolina. Uh, there are a handful of reports out there that uh, there was a lot of conversations being had of who, the, who the, the Panthers should take. Should it have been C.J. Stroud? Should it have been Bryce Young? And if if you are David Tepper, the, the owner of the Carolina Panthers, and you're watching C.J. Stroud, the guy that you are blaming Frank Reich for not taking... Uh, 
go take his offensive coordinator and hope that works <laughs> in Carolina with the guy you did take in Bryce Young. Um, I also think the commanders make some sense for Slowick. Um, it's a young team on offense that actually has some weapons. Like, Brian Robinson's good. Uh, Terry McLaurin is a good receiver. Curtis Samuels, a strong candidate to be a, a, a top 10 slot guy in the NFL. Like, they have some pieces there that actually, I think, could win some games. And the Giants are dumpster fire. The Eagles uh, are still good, but look like they might make some wholesale changes out there if they lose in the playoffs, at least on offense and defense when it comes to their coordinators. So, you know, could they be kind of on the downward trend? Then you have the Cowboys, who, if they don't win a playoff game or they lose in the second round again to San Francisco or, you know, don't go as far as they want to go, could they fire McCarthy? Like, there are a lot of changes that can be had in the NFC East that I think could turn the tide for the Commanders. Uh, they want a quarterback. If you're Bobby Slowick, you've seen what... Michael Ryans and you have done with a young quarterback and CJ Stroud you've seen that if you get the right guy that can come in and be an instant impact player for you you can turn some heads no they're not going to be a great team the Texans aren't a great team but they have the right pieces there to make moves they brought in veteran players like Jimmy Ward and others to help the defense to get Stroud on offense uh if you're Slowick I do think there might be a chance you leave for Washington. Now, here's this. Before I get to the next two destinations he might land in, uh, Demeco Ryans was offered a, a head coaching job uh, two off seasons ago, right? And he said no. Um, he said that, you know, I, I, I want to stay. There's a, plenty I have to learn still. Um, could Slowick take that route i think it's certainly viable it's certainly a viable option for him to talk to the mecco and say hey like you didn't take a job when you had the viking job basically kind of given to you and you said no um should i do the same thing like is there more of me to learn or more for me to learn maybe it's hey i don't want to leave houston i don't want to leave cj stroud i i I want to do something here. I, I believe in this team. I believe in this quarterback and what you're preaching. Could Slowick stay? I don't doubt it one bit, at least for one more season, right? But if he doesn't choose to stay, I think Las Vegas makes some sense. They they just need... Like, Slowick makes sense knowing that Vegas will likely wants to draft the quarterback and doesn't really have, like, in my mind, Slowick would make sense if you're drafting somebody and then keeping Jimmy G, and which, which I don't think is in the cards for Vegas, knowing he's hurt a lot and the money he's making. But Slowick, having known Jimmy G for a handful of years, having coached with him for a handful of years, having had success as his past game slash OC for a year last year in San Francisco. Um, could that be a place where he visits and says, hey, like, I can piece this thing together for a little bit, then get my quarterback and we can take on New Horizons? That's certainly an option for him. But the place I have Bobby Slowick going is the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Rand Carthen, uh, him and Slowick have Niners ties. I think if you are Tennessee, you're looking at teams like the Texans, teams like the Colt with Anthony Richardson once he gets healthy, and teams like the Jaguars that, if they can get healthy, they fire 10 coaches a handful of days ago. They're making, you know, wholesale changes. They know they underperformed this year after nearly beating the Chiefs in the playoffs one year ago, right? I think if you're the Tennessee Titans, you want to get a guy in here that can, with the right quarterback, whether it's Levis or somebody else, that can get you the guy that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those offenses. Now, would Slowick leave, you know, for an AFC South rival? Who knows? But... I think it makes a ton of sense that they might get desperate, maybe. You know, you're not going to go replace Vrabel with Belichick. Why not get the exact opposite of a Mike Vrabel? Don't get a former player. 
Don't get kind of a leader of men defensive guy. Go get you an offensive coordinator that knows Kyle Shanahan's system, that has pieces, DeAndre Hopkins, Traylon Burks. Maybe you bring back Derrick Henry. You have Tajay Spears. Like, there is some stuff to work with in Tennessee. And maybe you give Will Levis one year to figure things out. And if he's not good, you move on and you find your guy in the draft. I do think that that makes a ton of sense for Bobby Slowick. Um, it also gives him one year to implement his system to other players and his hope the quarterback thing works itself out. If it ain't Levis, fine. You can get your guy after this year or after next year, excuse me. But I think their ties with the Niners, Carthon, and Slowick make a ton of sense only if he wants to leave Houston. I think it makes a lot of sense for him. Uh, it would be a good opportunity for him to actually get that job and make a name for himself after having a great season in Houston with Stroud and Emeka Ryans. And my number five top five coaching candidate. So again, there are four jobs gone. Ben Johnson, the Panthers. Jim Harbaugh, the Raiders. Bill Belichick, the Chargers. And Bobby Slowick, if he leaves Houston to the Tennessee Titans. We got two jobs left, the Commanders and the Falcons. My number five top five coaching candidate is Todd Monken, the Ravens offensive coordinator this year. Um, he was brought in to replace Greg Roman, and we have seen the Ravens offense, mainly Lamar Jackson being the main piece here, become or turn back into his MVP form, uh, likely going to win the award, although it's still Brock Purdy in my eyes. <laughs> um, but you, you cannot deny the impact he's had on the Baltimore Ravens offense, whether it's going through Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins and Keaton Mitchell and Justice Hill and having, you know, Rashad Bateman and OBJ and Zay Flowers and Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely like, there's not a lot of big names out there in Baltimore outside of Mark Andrews and Lamar Jackson, but I think what Todd Monken has done, bringing over that kind of Georgia offense into the NFL and kind of morphing it into, into what helps Lamar Jackson succeed, I think if you're a team like the Carolina Panthers, it makes sense with Bryce Young. You know, you see the impact on a, on, on a young quarterback like Jackson, who, again, has already won an MVP, having an insane year again this year. After having, I don't want to say a down year last year, but just not, not, not being MVP Lamar Jackson. But I think the team that actually makes a ton of sense for Todd Monken is the Atlanta Falcons. Um... I think the Falcons are a quarterback away from going to the playoffs. Uh, already talked about this with Bill Belichick, so I won't you know linger on it too long. But um, there's a lot of conversation as to what are the Bears going to do with Justin Fields. Um, if I'm Chicago, I think I'm trading the first overall pick and building up the offensive line, building up the defense, because I think Fields looked good enough at the end of the year this year to kind of give him one more shot at it. Um, you can kind of tell the Bears came around towards the end where they were actually a serious, you know, threat to a handful of teams' playoff hopes. And I think I think for the Bears, if you're going to keep Justin Fields, okay. But if you're the Falcons and you've watched Desmond Ritter and, and you've watched, you know, Taylor Heineke, like you want to get the guy in the building – um, if a place like Atlanta intrigues Russell Wilson, or maybe a place like Atlanta intrigues a Kirk Cousins, or dare I say, again, if the Bears want Caleb Williams, do you go and get Justin Fields, bring him back to Georgia, and let Ton Monken, who, you know, again, the Georgia ties are there for both of them, albeit not together, but... Do you bring both those people back to a place that's so familiar to them as a person? And you let Monken have this Lamar Jackson-like impact on Justin Fields. Again, the Falcons win two more games. They're a playoff team. <laughs> Had they won one more game and the Bucks lost, they're a playoff team. The defense is hit or miss sometimes. Uh, that can improve through the draft or free agency, but... 
if you're Todd Monken and you've, okay, cool, like, I coached the MVP this year. I'm ready to move on to a head coaching job. And maybe he is, maybe he's not. But if there's a place I'd want to go, why not go to a place that you've called home the past handful of seasons and you find yourself a quarterback you like? You already have B. John Robinson and Tyler Algier, and you have Kyle Pitts and Drake London. Like, you have young weapons to build around. If you want to get Russell Wilson for a year or Kirk Cousins or somebody else I'm sure I'm forgetting about, that can be a stopgap for a year or two before you find your guy in the draft or whatever it might be. I think Atlanta makes a ton of sense for Todd Monken. If I'm the Falcons and I'm Arthur Blank, that's who I'm targeting. I'm not targeting Belichick. I'm not targeting Ben Johnson or, or Slowick or Vrabel. I'm like, hey, like, I'm going for Todd Monken, uh, and that makes a ton of sense to me. I, I, maybe it's just me putting two and two together, but or, or relying on the Georgia connection too much. But I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I know I said there was one job left. There actually is two jobs, but again, you have the Patriots who the fire bill. That's going to Mike Grable. So we have essentially filled five and actually six head coaching jobs. Ben Johnson to the Panthers, Jim Harbaugh to the Raiders, Bill Belichick to the Chargers, Bobby Slowick to the Titans, and Todd Monken to the Falcons, and of course Mike Vrabel to the New England Patriots, leaving one job left, and okay, you have one job left and I haven't named Steve Oaks yet. I know it's been 41 minutes, I hope you have stuck by me here. This is why I don't believe Steve Wilkes is going to be a head coach and leave San Francisco this offseason. Uh, I think if you're Steve Wilkes, you dealt with David uh, Tepper in Carolina. You don't want any dysfunction. Uh, you're not also dying for a, a head coaching job, right? And again, there could be more openings down the road that we don't know about just yet. Um, I think Adam Peters is good as gone. I think he will go someplace and maybe it is Washington and maybe he wants to take Steve Oaks with him. I don't think that's going to happen, but for Adam Peters, it makes a ton of sense for him to leave San Francisco knowing he will never be the guy making decisions in San Francisco as long as John Lynch is here. Right. John Lynch, by all intents and purposes, is not leaving for television, at least just yet. And as long as he's here, Adam Peters is never going to get the credit, never going to be the guy drafting, you know, star players. He'll be in the room. He'll be, oh, an assistant GM. But if you want to be the guy, even if they even if they approach him saying, hey, Adam, we'll give you the position of GM. John Lynch is still going to be somewhere in the building with a higher title, still making those positions. And nobody wants to be GM by title alone. You want to hold that job, making those choices. That's not going to happen in San Francisco as long as John Lynch is here. I truly think he can go to a team like Washington with a brand new ownership group that wants to start a rebuild, wants to build that team's culture, and wants to give the reins over to a young GM with a handful of success on a team that already has a great culture and knows how to win. If you're Adam Peters, Washington, they are going to give you the keys to make a team how you deem fit. Or there's a team like the Raiders that they already have a lot of star power. You have to re-sign Josh Jacobs, mind you, but Zamir White was great. Devontae Adams is still there. Like, you have pieces. Max Crosby's, like, you have your star offensive player and your star edge rusher. You have your Debo and your Nick Bosa per se, right? Like, you have guys already in the building of Las Vegas that make a lot of sense. Uh, maybe you want to, you know, clean some cap up and move some guys around. I just think Washington and Vegas make a ton of sense for Adam Peters. I really wouldn't be surprised if Washington is that team for him. Uh, but then you get to Steve Wilkes, who Peters, good is gone. Could Peters take Steve Wilkes with him? 
maybe. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but Steve Wilkes, to me, in my opinion, he finds himself outside of the top five coaching candidates. And he's also had one of the least successful head coaching stints of the remaining suitors. And he's a defensive mind. Now, I get it. Steve Wilkes in Arizona. He was hamstrung. Josh Rosen. Like, there was a bunch of crap going on there that just didn't favor him. He was unceremoniously and unjustifiably fired in Arizona. It happens. It stinks. Um, there's a reason why they fired two head coaches after him. Or, or one in Cliff Kingsbury. Like, they don't know what they're doing until now. And they just hope they know what they're doing now. <laughs> right? But uh, he's also a defensive mind. And I can see a team turning away from him because of that. Especially Washington. You just brought in Ron Rivera. It didn't work out. Uh, I think if you're Washington, you're shooting for the stars, hoping an offensive coordinator like, you know, coach comes out and is like, pick me, pick me. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, so I, I could see Washington kind of being a little leery of Steve Wilkes by none of his own doing, just because they've been burned before by Rivera. Uh, maybe they want to promote the enemy from the inside to head coach and give him a chance. Maybe that's the case. Or maybe they want to give somebody like a Dan Quinn a, a chance again to say, hey, you were in the Super Bowl. You'll give us some credibility. You can lead the offense, the enemy, you, or excuse me, Dan Quinn, you go lead, go lead the defense, the enemy, you lead the offense. Like, I can see that being the case. Um, and like I was saying, I would assume a team like Washington or even somebody else uh, would turn their eyes towards Dan Quinn, uh, maybe the Ravens, Tom McDonald, and even somebody like Raheem Morris, who I know McDonald, it would be his first head coaching job, which might be a good thing for him to be a fresh face a fresh voice in a room. Then you have Dan Quinn and Morris, who I know their last handful of years coaching, especially Morris, wasn't very pretty with the Bucks, And Quinn's last few years in Atlanta weren't great either. But the past few years, they have kind of rehabilitated their image around the league of like, hey, like they deserve a second chance or a third chance as a head coach. Um, so I could see teams kind of being like, yeah, Steve Wilkes, like, you don't give us pedigree. Well, you are so well-respected. Um, there's a quote here via Jordan Schultz, who talked to uh, a handful of executives and players and whatnot. Uh, he said he was told that one of the things Steve Wilkes does best is simplifying complex schemes for players, and he has a unique ability to connect personally with his team, he creates trust and motivation. So again, nothing I said is to discredit Steve Wilkes. Uh, he has a what top three defense in the entire league this year. Like I'm happy he's in San Francisco. I want to keep him here at least for one more season. I think in a year or so, after 2024 is all said and done, that would be the year he leaves. Um, it makes sense. You do it two years in a row, you find success. It's a lot harder to buy into a defensive coordinator taking a job in this NFL. Teams want the offensive guru. They want the McVay. They want the Shanahan. We are going to see more Shanahan-like disciples, a.k.a. Bobby Slowick, get jobs. It is, is what it is, and you're going to see guys like Steve Wilkes, who are veterans, been around for a handful of regimes, but the Carolina and Arizona and back to Carolina and now San Francisco, guys who just are respected that you look at them and say, wow, that guy's a leader. You buy into him. Uh, you're going to see guys like that that don't get opportunities simply because they don't coach the offense. Um, and I think for Steve Wilkes, him being a defensive mind, is going to come back to bite him at least for one year. And because really where he's coached, he hasn't had a lot of success as the head coach. Whereas you have Dan Quinn, who you're like, wow, like the Falcons, you were a good head coach for a while there. Could you come to Washington? 
be the defensive mind. Yeah, be enemy for a year can be the offensive guy. You find your quarterback in the draft or you bring in a veteran guy. Maybe Kirk Cousins comes back. That would be pretty insane in my, in, in my opinion. Um, I just think Steve Wilk's going to find himself being like the odd man out. Like even going further into this, let's say Las Vegas retains Antonio Pierce. Where does Harbaugh go? Does he go back to Michigan? Certainly. Does he go to the Chargers? Let's say he goes to the Chargers. Where does Belichick go? Does Belichick then go, hey, I'm going to go to Washington. I'm going to go to the Falcons. Maybe some of those are better than others, but I think he's going to find himself being like, hey, like I'm not the offensive guy. I don't carry the pedigree that even people like Dan Quinn do, which I think is a sad thing, but I think it's true. I'm not a hot name like Slowick or McDonald or even Todd Munkin. And I'm not even a Raheem Morris guy who, relatively young, has taken nothing with the Rams this year and made it relatively serviceable. They're a playoff team. And many fans are scared of the Rams. Not because of the defense, mind you, but uh, you take a lot of young players and make them overperform, you're going to catch the eye of some. I do think there are a handful of people, especially higher ups, that are going to say, yeah, you took San Francisco's defense and made it the same. Wow. I think that's unfair, but I do think that's going to be the case of like, you're coaching an already good team that's still already really good. <laughs> like, you haven't done much with Nick Bosa and Hargrave and Armstead and, and Chase Young. Like, you really haven't had to do too much. And even then, like... You can poke holes in Steve Volk's game, I think. Um, now, how big are those holes? Minuscule, I think. But I just think you look at it and you sit back and you're like, so you don't have the pedigree. The track record isn't there as a head coach. You coach a defense and you're coaching one of the best defenses that was already good before you got there. Um, I think all of that goes against Steve Volk's case for a head coaching job. Uh, and I also think that right now, um, this is actually a really good head coaching class to need a head coach in. Bill Belichick, the greatest coach of what, the 21st century, easily. Um, you have Rabel, who, if he goes to New England, it makes a ton of sense. He has ties there. Players love him. Then you have your, your OCs, your gurus. You have your Ben Johnsons that make a ton of sense, where he was would be easily the 1A for me. Then you have your Jim Harbaugh's who Jim could easily jump Belichick and Vrabel as the one of the most wanted guys as a head coach. Then you have your other OCs, Monken and Slowick, that make just like, yeah, MVP Lamar Jackson could have been Pro Bowl CJ Stroud. <laughs> like, I think that would wow people more than you took Nick Bosa to the playoffs. Big deal. Like, you had a good defense with all pros literally everywhere. <laughs> um, I think he's a victim of circumstance, that being Steve Wilkes. Um, I do want to toss this out there. It's a wild card. It's a wild card. So stick with me. Um, I do wonder if there's an off chance that Steve Wilkes and Carolina could realign their stars and their chakras and find themselves holding hands saying, I do once again. Um, I think if you're David Tepper, you need to have consistency. You need to have a leader that can face the noise, face the music, and not shy away. And I think of when Steve Wilkes was getting criticized here for the three-game losing streak, the zero blitz against the Vikings, and they're going to the bye week like, oh my god, like, this is not good. And they asked him, like, you know, are, are you ready? Like, you're facing a lot of criticism. Like, how do you take it? Him saying, I'm built for this, that, that I can take this. I do think if you're David Tepper, you go, I need a guy like that. Um, or, if, or, if you, or if Ben Johnson says, I am coming to your dysfunctional, you know, cat house. I'm, I'm not coming there, right? I, I'm, I'm not declawing the kitty, right? I think if you're Steve Wilkes and David Tepper's like, please save me, I made a mistake. I think it could be a place for him that he's already called it home twice. Um, if Tepper gets, 
you know, desperate and, and they're missing out on all their options? Could it be a place for Steve Wilkes? I'm sure it's a long shot. How often do you see a guy go from Carolina somewhere else? Carolina, somewhere else, looking back to Carolina, it doesn't happen very often, um, unless you're Mike or Josh McDaniel or Matt Patricia or a a Belichick disciple who always seems to find their way back to New England. Um, it really isn't the case, uh, but I, I I just do think that Carolina could make a ton of sense um, for Steve Wilkes. Going back to the quote, uh, he can simplify schemes for players. He can connect to them personally, uh, and he creates trust and motivation. Uh, if there is a team that needs trust, needs motivation, and to simplify simplify things for their players, um, if that doesn't sound like Carolina, I, I don't know what does. Um, obviously, there'll be a big task of getting an offensive coordinator in that room, uh, but on the off chance... I do think of all the places that Steve Wilkes makes a lot of sense. It's either going to be Carolina or if the Chargers don't get Harbaugh, don't get Johnson, don't get Vrabel, and especially don't get Belichick, uh, which I think should be the number one choice there. Could Steve Wilkes make a lot of sense in L.A.? Uh, those are the two places, but I can almost guarantee you um, Steve Wilkes would be both their teams like fourth or fifth option um it's going to take a herculean effort or dare i say it's going to take catastrophe meaning that other teams are whiffing left and right on their one two three four five options for steve wilkes to get a job i know it sounds crazy um when this team has a top five defense and he's been a big part of improving Avery thomas's career uh lenore's career and even mooney ward who I think was tied for the most pass deflections and uh, what fourth in interceptions with, with five. They had Jair Brown and, and Logan Ryan and Hufunga. Like there's been a lot of good from Steve Wilkes, but I, I just think that this is not the year for him to become a head, a head coach. And dare I say, I, I, I hate saying this because it kind of makes me feel a little icky here about this because, you know, there is a minority rule where if you interview people and they get hired away from you, like a Demeca Ryans, like a Mike McDaniel, like a Rand Carthen, like a Martin Mayhew, where if you have a minority executive or coach and they get hired elsewhere, you get draft picks. San Francisco does not get draft picks for Steve Wilkes this year. You have to be in a place for at least two seasons for that to occur. Now, that went into none of my opinion. That went into none of my thought process here. But if you are someone who was like, well, don't I get draft picks for him? The answer is no. Like Steve Oaks would leave San Francisco empty handed. So there isn't a, a chance of like, I want Wilkes to leave because of draft picks. It's not going to happen this year. Um, if he stays, which I think he will, if you prioritize draft picks over good defense or prioritize draft picks over having an, a locked down coaching staff, then okay. Um, you have to wait two seasons for that to occur. Um, I'm not someone who thinks that way, but I know plenty of people are at least asking on Twitter and X and on social media. So no, if Wilkes leaves, no draft picks. Uh, so again, that doesn't bother me. Like that's not my thought process here. I I just don't think Wilkes makes a lot of sense for any of the head coaching jobs opening or open currently, unless something crazy happens and they miss on their top five options, right? Uh, and again, on on the plus side, if he stays one more year and leaves next year, you get the third round picks you want, right? So, um, again, Adam Peters, he's gone. <laughs> like. If he's not gone, something has, again, something crazy has happened and just either he bombed the interview or there are inept presidents and owners everywhere. Because why wouldn't you want Adam Peters, who has learned from arguably one of the best GMs in the entire league, has been in the draft room where you hit on so many late round picks, um makes a sense to, to want that guy in the building for you then steve wilkes i think he's staying 
I just I just don't think his name carries enough weight. And I just think for him, you're in a bad head coach. Like it would take a really poor coaching uh, grouping or openings uh, to to kind of have him be the one A or one B or even being like a top five guy for me. I like Steve Wilkes. He's awesome. He's a great guy. I I just think this year is not his year to be a head coach. Um, But next year, I think makes a lot of sense for Steve Wilkes. Okay. That was all I had to say for one hour. I thought this show was going to be 30 minutes. I talk for a long time. I apologize. Hope you're having a wonderful week. Um, The playoffs are almost here, folks. I am currently drafting my NFL playoff wild card weekend preview, which may or may not have an entire playoff preview prediction show coming out this Friday. So stay tuned Um, again. Playoffs are right here. I cannot wait. Uh, San Francisco. uh, I won't spoil too much, but I'm rooting for a certain team, maybe called the Cheeseheads. (laughs) Just saying. Um, To knock off the the Dallas Cowboys, because why wouldn't you, right? Uh, But uh, that's all I have for you today. Hope you're having a wonderful week. Hope you are getting your 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 super wild card parties ready to go. You got chips, your pizza, your hot wings, whatever you like. Hope you already have those orders ready to go on speed. They are going to have so much fun and look, the NFL never stops. So there are going to be a lot more shows like this during the playoffs. Hopefully it's more so just let's stick to football, but so many things happen over the course of the NFL. I wish they wouldn't do this during the playoffs. I'd rather the GMs and the coaches and the OCs and the DCs, just be able to focus on the games they're going to have. Um, but it's the NFL. It ain't that way. So we'll see what happens for San Francisco. Um, I would like to think that many teams would decline interviews during the week. Um, it didn't happen for San Francisco the past two, three seasons, but I hope Steve Wilkes is like, no, I have bigger business to take care of. It's called beating uh, a team in the divisional round and the NFC championship then the Super Bowl, but I digress. Um, so much news to to occur, so many things to happen. San Francisco's finally healthy again. Eric Armstead's back. Juwan Jennings is back, and the team is back together. We are effing back, folks, and we have one more week to go to get even healthier. How great is that? Um, that being said, any news that happens, coaching updates, player updates, anything that happens, Follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the Twitter. 49ers uh, dot access is the Instagram. Again, all the updates are on there. Uh, We're going to be talking Niners all week long. As long as the playoffs go, we are talking San Francisco 49ers. And when they end, we're still talking San Francisco 49ers. You can also use our promo code 49ers access at SeatGeek.com. For $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's for concerts, baseball games, NBA games, and especially NFL playoff games. If you want to watch any game. In fact, San Francisco has the second highest ticket prices in the league right now for a playoff game. Around like $390. You take $20 bucks off, it'll buy you a beer. It'll pay for like a third of your parking. With that being said, any discount works in your favor. If you want to watch, again, MLB, NBA, NFL, your Niners play, a $20 discount is on your way if you use our promo code 49ersaccess at SeatGeek.com. With that being said, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on YouTube. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe on the audio platforms put your comments down below give us five stars do you think adam peters and steve wilkes will leave if so where do you think they'll go and what do you think of my head coaching predictions are they crazy are they actually smart i like to think so i put them together in five minutes (laughs) that being said thank you for watching thank you for listening Stay tuned for Friday, NFL Playoff Preview and Prediction Show coming up just a handful of days away. And until next time, stay faithful.